Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. We've done nearly 650 of them now. If this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. Uh, you could also, of course, browse around in the YouTube channel, but on batgap.com, they're much better organized. There are <clears throat> several different indexes of you know, ways of, or, that I've organized them. Um, this uh, program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there's a PayPal button on every page of the site, and there's also a page which suggests alternatives to PayPal. My guest today is Karen V. Johnson. Um, Karen was a graduate of Georgetown Law Center, a former Fulbright scholar who studied in Afghanistan. She holds master's degrees in public health and public and international affairs. She was a federal administrative law judge who practiced criminal and energy law for more than 30 years. She is also a former US, Navy, US Army officer, uh, was a major there in the Army. She was personally trained by Alberto Villoldo. Um, there's an abrupt shift from all that army and law stuff to being trained by him and as a faculty at, at the Four Winds Society and a master practitioner of energy medicine. She has trained extensively in the techniques of illumination, soul retrieval, extractions of energies and entities, divination, and death rites. Um, her book, which I read this week, is entitled Living Grieving, Using Energy Medicine to Alchemize Grief and Loss. And this book and also the shift from her straight-laced career <laughs> path to her kind of a very unorthodox interests was um, catalyzed by the sudden unexpected death of her son due to a heroin, heroin overdose. So I'm sure you know, Karen will be talking about that story. And, um, you know, Karen, I was thinking, I hope you don't mind starting with this, but as we speak, we're four days out from the um, massacre of 19 children in Texas, um, which, uh, in other words, a, nor a, nor a normal day in America, but worse than usual. And, um, you know, people are all over the country are feeling lots of grief, but it's hard to imagine what the parents are feeling. And if you had the opportunity to speak to those parents, knowing what you know now, and after everything you've been through, what do you think you might say to them? Well, that's a really tough one because there's two kinds of deaths that are the worst, unexpected death and the death of a child. And when you have an unexpected death of a child, you're really in a world of hurt. So one thing I would tell people at this moment is just to be, be with the pain, be with the anger, be with the fear, and that grief is a journey and that they are embarking on the biggest journey of their lives and as they embark on this journey to make a reckoning with grief to go to, through the stages to being reborn into a new life out of the ashes of the old that honor their loved ones um, that there is hope it doesn't seem at this moment when death comes knocking like that there doesn't seem to be hope all there seems to be is despair and sadness and hopelessness and um, to just know that there is more more will be coming and life isn't over it seems like it's over when you lose a child it really seems like life is over and you kind of wish it were over yeah right it's trying to bear the unbearable in a few minutes we're going to talk more about your background and you had some profound experiences as, as a child growing up which to my mind means you kind of already had a toe in the waters of uh, deeper mystical understanding of things um, but then you had gone through you know a life which pretty much numbed that out of you um, I presume most of the parents in Texas are Catholics they're you know um, Latino people, and uh, so they they would have a belief in the afterlife and, and so on. Um, do you feel that at least a belief 
if not some sort of experiential evidence in the continuation of life after death helps to um, mitigate the pain of, of grief somewhat, or is it too superficial to really do that? Yeah. You know, as a, whenever I, I think about death, um, you know, either somebody I know dies or I speak at a funeral or something like that, I'm, which I haven't done very many, very often, but um, I'm reminded there's a whole string of verses in the Bhagavad Gita where Krishna is talking about death and he says things like Arjuna is grieving over the potential death of all these people he's supposed to fight. And, uh, and Krishna says, you, um, how is this? you grieve for those for whom there should be no grief, yet speak as do the wise. Wise men grieve neither for the dead nor for the living. And, you know, I, that kind of makes sense in terms of understanding reincarnation and the, the soul lives on after the body dies and all that stuff. But um, I just wonder if it's unnatural to try to take refuge in concepts like that. Or perhaps, again, understanding that bigger picture, you still are going to grieve because it's human, but somehow it's eased a little bit uh, by understanding that, as opposed to thinking that this is the utter end of this person that I loved and they no longer exist or I can no longer have any kind of relationship with them on any in any way. Yeah, I, I when I work with people, I one thing I mentioned to them is we can't change anybody's mind. We can't change anything except our own perspective. And if we keep in mind that really they're just right beside us, they're around us. And sometimes people will say, well, if they're in heaven, then how can they be around us? What happened? And I said, well, it's not prison, <laughs> right? They're allowed to come back and forth and they visit and they do visit. And so, um, I, you know, I really try to help people to change their perspective, to remember they're right there, to remember they're not gone. It's really hard because it's not the same as getting a hug from them. It's not the same as making them breakfast in the morning. It's just not. Yeah. So we have to transition into this new relationship with our loved ones on the other side. And it, it takes a little time, it takes a little doing, but if you keep that in mind, if you keep the internal life part in mind, I didn't have that. I didn't, wasn't particularly religious. And so um, when my son passed, I was standing, I was in the airport in South Korea. I had gone to South Korea for, for a vacation and he appeared in front of me. And I thought, oh my gosh. And then he kind of faded away. Now, and I've heard I, you say that. When he appeared in front of you, was he a little ghostly? Was it like this sort of... No. It no was or was just it like, like as solid yep. as anybody else in the airport? Yep, solid. Just oh. solid. He was like okay. right in front of me with his big old grin. And then... You must have thought, then, what the heck is he doing what? in South Korea? Right. I got... Well, and I called my ex-husband and I said, you know, he's alive. I think he's alive. You got to call the ME. You got to have her. I think he's in the in the freezer. Maybe he's trying to get out. You got to call. I was frantic. I was, you know, hysterical. And so um, he called, and she very kindly sent one of her texts to look and said, "No, I'm sorry, he's gone." Right. And so, um, but the 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 beauty of it all for me was that I had now had this true vision and opportunity to see that there really is life after death. Yeah. Something I I really wasn't sure I believed in. I wasn't sure where we go. I probably would have said alive is alive, dead is dead before. And now I know there's so much more. I think that if a person who doesn't think there's life after death were to take a year off from whatever they're doing and watch all the videos and read all the books, it might mean to take five years off you know, right. uh, uh, about, you know, near-death experiences and reincarnation studies and all that stuff, they would have to come around. I don't see how they, they couldn't sort of accept it. But, you know, people get cubbyholed and they're busy and they don't have time to think about these things. Um, right. And, and so a lot of us want direct experience. Yeah. And so um, sometimes you don't get that kind of direct experience. People that are not maybe meditating or thinking about, as you say, these kind of spiritual things, um, we're really looking for that to come and hit them on the head. And I was one of the lucky ones that came and hit me on the head. 
And it was, you know, Elizabeth Lesser, I love her book, Broken Open. So I feel like I was broken open. I was cracked open and suddenly found myself out of the matrix altogether. I, nothing in life made any sense. And I'm having this experience with my son. And that spirit experience has continued to this very day. Sure. So seeing him, talking to him, um, we, I, he helps me transition souls to the other side. So we do a lot of, of work together uh, in a shamanic way. And um, yeah, it's an ongoing relationship. And so however you feel, see, know, sense that person, if you feel like, oh, I feel like they're standing right behind me. Oh, I feel like I'm hearing their voice or I'm smelling their smell or whatever it is, it's true. They are, they are with you and they're trying to get through in this very dense world, physical realm um, to us. And, and so it takes a little, takes a little awareness of subtle things yeah. because they can't just talk or don't usually come in full embodied. Maybe I was more open to it. I don't know why it happened to me that way. Or maybe that was the plan all along was to crack me open into a sp spiritual awareness in a way that I pretty much had resisted all my adult life. Yeah, we're going to talk about that a lot, I think. Um... I have a good friend named Susanna Marie who's been on this program a, a few times, and uh, her brother, who was very close to her, uh, died unexpectedly of a heroin overdose and hadn't, just like your son, hadn't been using heroin, decided to try it one time and he was gone. And um, she's a very sensitive person and kind of tuned into subtler things. And he was definitely, you know, there for quite a while. She was in tune with him, in touch with him, and, you know, uh, but then she she felt like at a certain point, I don't know how long it was, at a certain point, he was kind of moving on. And she couldn't contact him anymore mm -hmm. and didn't feel like she needed to because he had to do what he had to do. Um, right. But I would, you know, I could actually agree with both of what you, what, what you and she said, because maybe, you know, some people do move on. We all have different roles to play and different functions to serve. And maybe your son is playing a function in a realm that is still in proximity to ours in a way and mm -hmm. other people have to move on to other realms that are no longer you know in communication with ours anything's possible anything's possible you know the amitabha buddha um, is the buddha in charge of sukhavati so it's that realm between this world and nirvana mm -hmm. so i love that concept of sukhavati because many people say well i don't know i don't think i'm ready for nirvana i don't think i'm quite ascended but i really would like to get off the great wheel of life <laughs> right and so sukhavati is that middle place and so and we have heaven and we have you know we have so many concepts of where so souls can go and how they um can heal and learn things and so um I think it's I think it's beautiful to think that maybe they do have a role. I know my son said to me the other day, he said, Mom, quit digging my doorbell. He said, you're fine, you're fine. Because I was like his birthday or something and I was doing my sad mom thing, you know, and he said, I'm, I'm in the Jesus pod right now and, and this is really important work and um, you're fine, you're fine, you don't need me right now. And so he goes flitting off. Words, it's only were... a 27-year-old man can do, right? <laughs> In other words, you were sort of distracting him. He was busy doing something. I was distracted. I'm like, Ben, Ben, it's your birthday. Come down. I'm sad. And he's like, and then, you know, he said, too, he said, Mom, you're kind of a bummer with this. <laughs> I said, you know, this whole thing about you always being sad and morbid and morose around these events, you need to change that up. Uh -huh. And actually, that sort of has become the topic for my second book is changing it all up. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, so when you say you have one of these communications with your son, and you've had many, um, try to make that come to life for us. It, it, what would we, if I were having one of those, what would I actually be experiencing? Would I be, would it just be a vague, subtle intuition, or would it be like a crystal clear voice in my head, or what? Everybody's a little different because there's different kind of clairs, clear audience, clear sentient, different ways. So maybe somebody hears. Maybe somebody senses, clairsentient. Maybe somebody has an inner knowing. Maybe you have a vision. So I had the visual to begin with, but I didn't have the audience. So I went to a medium saying, he's right there, he's standing right there, he's talking, but I can't understand what he's saying, right? So, some, so everybody's a little different. And I 
do believe it takes a little bit of time because we've so in our society shut that down, shut down our intuition, our seventh sense. And so it takes a little while for our brains to make sense of it again because it's energy, it's interpreting energy and we're kind of in between, we're in quantum physics. So we're kind of dancing in between, you know, the atoms and electrons and, and all those things for consciousness. And so our brain has to kind of get accustomed to it. So, but if you're open to it and you say, oh, I just had that sense that the person was here. Yeah. And the sense may then lay, lay, let it later, <laughs> later lead to their voice. And it might later lead to other ways of knowing and sensing and seeing. So people get very frustrated because they say, I, I want to see my son just like you saw yours. And, and I say, well, you know, give it time. Allow yourself to dream about that and say out loud, yes, I want that experience. Yes, it's okay. I'm, you know, and, and see where it takes you. Yeah. Now, when you were a little girl, you were communicating with subtle beings, as uh, as you recounted in your book. Mm -hmm. There was some fairy who lived in a tree, and some Indian who lived in the basement, or something. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And uh, were those visual and auditory both, or what? They were. They were visual and auditory. With the with the 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 one that lived in the tree spirit that I played with all the time, the fairy. You know, I don't know um, what exactly she was, but um, but she's still a spirit guide. She still comes around. So um, yeah, so that was that was visual and audio because we played and we had conversations. And the the old man that lived in the basement, he scared the heck out of me. And then later on in life, I said, "Why'd you scare the heck out of me as a kid?" And, you know, and he said, well, the fairy was there for you to have a playmate and to have fun so you wouldn't be lonely. I was there when you needed courage. Hmm. And so very different roles yeah. uh, that they played. It's funny talking life. about this stuff because I always think of the audience when I do interviews and, uh, you know, the audience, Bat Gap audience in general is pretty open to this stuff. But if you think of yourself talking to a general audience about this kind of thing, like if you, if you went on CNN or something to talk about it, um, you know, half the people, if not more, would think you're just kind of nuts. Um, yep, for sure. <laughs> but, um, you know, I very much am open to the, I, I, it's kind of like reincarnation or many other things. I just feel like it's a fact of the way the universe works, that there are these subtler levels and that there are beings of various sorts who reside there and serve various functions. Some of them, um pertinent to our human lives others doing other things probably yeah and i think children are especially open they hadn't have it socialized out of them yeah Told, don't talk to anybody about that that's crazy that you know you're not seeing anything oh that's you're making this all up so um children really are sensitive to these en energies that are out there and and see things that maybe we don't see yeah i've mm -hmm. talked to quite a few people um, who have had those kind of, in fact, a lot of people who come on Bat Gap who are on Bat Gap because they have blossomed into some sort of spiritual awakening had something like that when they were kids, something unusual or you know, deeper. And very often it got blotted out when they got into their teenage years and so on. And then later on, they, there was either some event or just some craving began to arise to um, discover a deeper meaning to life. And one thing led to the next, you know, yeah. but it um, seems like a lot of people do have at least people who seem to be destined for some kind of spiritual blossoming later in life, very often have tastes of it early in life. Yeah, that could be, that could very well be. Maybe it's a, your brain, your mind, your soul is a precondition for it, open for it. Yeah. Well, I, I think people come into this life at varying levels of evolution, spiritual development, sensitivity. And, uh, you know, so it's like we, people come in with different musical aptitudes or whatever. Mozart, you know, he came in as a genius. Uh, and I was watching some little kid the other day playing Mozart, five years old. He couldn't even Me reach too. The, the pedals. Did you see him? Yeah, and, yeah. And he's just going along. He's not even looking at his fingers. He's doing this beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, so I don't know. Obviously, skeptics would have other ways of explaining this. But I really think that we accumulate various things in, in each lifetime. And, and very often we bring some of those things into, into our next one. Yeah.
Yeah. yeah. I think so too. And I think it's always what you're what you're ready for yeah. in this then this time place. Yeah, what you're ready for and maybe what you need. And what you need. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is I think a, a theme underlying your whole story. Um if if you hadn't said this yourself in the book. I would feel um, insensitive to even suggest it, but you, you kind of got around to the understanding that there was some kind of agreement with you and your son and some kind of orchestration of the way yeah. events were going to unfold. And in fact, when he was young, he was saying, well, mom, I'm not going to live a very long life. And you were saying, no, don't be silly. And, uh, right. you know, so he had an intuition about that. And then, you know, he died. Um, he in communications with you now, he says he's, you know, a lot happier where he is. Yeah. And and you're a lot better off than you were because you're not working 10 hours a day plus commuting two hours in, in heavy traffic. <laughs> so yeah. everything has worked out for the best, but yeah. not not in a way you would have signed up for in this life had you, you know, seen it coming. You would have said, no, some other way, please. Yeah, for sure. And I thought, well, wow, you know, someone suggested, well, maybe there was a cosmic crazy cosmic tea party and we cooked this scheme up he was going to die early and i was going to be spiritual and i'm uh, going to write a book and help people about grief and i thought oh what a bad soul not am i a bad person i'm a bad soul mm -hmm. bad me then bad me now it's like pema Chodron talks about right in some of her tapes that's you know our western mind we just can't accept that anything like that that just means okay bad me then bad me now bad <laughs> all the time right yeah um, who was it? Rob Schwartz. You, you know, Rob Schwartz, I interviewed him and he was sort of a protege of um, Michael Newton, who wrote those books about life between lives. Mm, yeah. and, and his whole thing is kind of understanding how we, we kind of plan out the life we're going to live, uh, probably in collaboration with whatever wise guides help us do such things. But um, he, he felt, he feels that any really significant event that happens in life we signed up for um, yeah even the horrific ones but there's some kind of cosmic significance to it which may not be obvious to us now but was obvious to us then yeah yeah i think i think so too and sometimes we just can't quite grasp it right away but the meaning comes later and the meaning will come if you're open to it I think sometimes people get so lost and stuck in their grief that they can't see anything and they, they choose not to. And so one of the practices in the book that I love is um, indigenous alchemy. And indigenous alchemy is innate or native desire for transformation. And I think that as humans, we have that within us. We have this innate desire for transformation. And when we stay stuck in our grief and loss and we refuse to move on, don't want to move on, really hold that down. We really, it's, it, it can cause illnesses and sicknesses and, and a lot of suffering. Um, and so that's, that's something too that I think we have, we have to get in touch with our own humanity. And if you look at Greg Braden's recent book, The Wisdom Codes, and, um, there's one section on grief and loss and the, all of them talk about transformation and moving on and allowing this to go through us we're never meant to be stuck in our grief and loss we're to use this energy to move to move forward to to learn to grow to honor our loved ones you know people tell me well that's all well and good if i i have a new life and i am uh <laughs> doing all these great things but then doesn't that make me a bad person I mean, here I am going to create a new life and my loved one's gone. And, and, and so we, we get this, it's sort of like um, cognitive dissonance going on where we think, okay, I kind of see what she's talking about. But then again, what will my loved one think of me? Well, will they think I don't love them. And so one of the eight things, uh, eight things that spirits on the other side wish you knew, that, according to Ben, and one of them is as we stay stuck in our grief and loss, our loved ones too stay stuck. You know, we're kind of holding on to their kite string a little bit. And as we're able to let go, and as we're able to transform our lives to live better lives, you know, asking those big questions like, is this really the life I want to live? Or is this life 
something that I'm living that people told me I ought to live, or I chose, but I didn't really choose. I thought this was the way. So when we start asking the bigger questions and transforming our lives and changing our perspectives, they too are able to move on on the other side and do yeah. very cool things. Did you ever see that movie with Robin Williams called What Dreams May Come? No, I haven't seen that one. Yeah, his wife got killed um, somehow or died or something. And there was this mutual stuckness and somehow or other he went to the other side somehow or other and helped her get unstuck. She was in this doldrums in some, in some dark place. You might want to check it out. Oh yeah. yeah. That sounds yeah. like a good one. Um, there's also a guy I interviewed a while back named father Nathan castle. And his whole thing is helping stuck souls cross over. Yes. And, and generally it's people who have died suddenly and violently for some reason. Yeah. And they've gotten stuck in some kind of, astral antechamber or something <laughs> and yes. uh and he has the particular skill to assist them and yeah. uh it, it, this skill just sort of he was sort of picked to do this and uh because he just somehow has the aptitude but anyway um i think your point is a good one it's it, we're not benefiting anyone by staying stuck in fact that it sort of goes against the evolutionary current of life that is not going to stop flowing no matter what um yeah. we're, we're just kind of creating a snag in the river that's creating turbulence yeah and just as in the movie he was helping his wife become unstuck there our loved ones are trying to help us become unstuck here yeah we just can't always hear their voices and we've been enculturated i mean there's no win in grief if you grieve too long and too hard then you know they say well you you now have a, a psychi psychiatric illness in the dsm and you need medication mm. and if you don't grieve long enough and hard enough by somebody's standards <laughs> they're going to say well you know you you parent well she didn't really seem to care she seemed to have gotten over that very easily mm. so there, there's just no win so you might as well grieve your own grief in your own way keeping in mind that it's a journey a journey it's a journey it's yeah. not a one thing so it's not staying stuck and saying okay i'm going to show everybody including my loved one that's passed how much i love them because i am just going to keep their room a shrine and i am not going to move on i'm going to stay in the house and i'm going to isolate myself just to prove prove something you know to show how much i cared they already know how much you cared yeah and you did that for a while i did that for a while yeah too. you didn't make his bed or anything like that no no, yeah. no, I didn't pick up yeah. his dirty laundry on the floor. I didn't do anything. I just wanted to be right there with him. And actually, my daughter ended up clearing his room out for me. Hmm. Uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it. Yeah. Um, we made an interesting point just then, which is that I suppose that there are cultural attitudes about how long people are supposed to grieve, but it's, isn't it kind of a, really a private matter? And, uh, you know, you shouldn't let anybody tell you what's right for you in that regard. Although, you know, obviously, if you if you do really get stuck for long, long periods of time, and um, you might need help, um, you know, getting pride out of it. Um, for sure. But it's really for nobody to judge, but it might be for someone to help if you can, uh, if you can use a little help. I think a lot of time people need a little help, but we become very isolated uh, in our grief because we know that we make people around us uncomfortable. And so we tend to go inside, shut the doors, don't wanna go out, don't wanna go anywhere. And um, just to, to stop having to, we want one, one pity. We don't wanna to be told, okay, it's time now, let's go. We're gonna go, it's time for you to go to a party. It's time for you to do, it's time, it's time. What time, whose time? But we're not ready, right? So that's sort of the direction my book is is it's like a precursor to all those things that you might do in time so instead of jumping right into doing 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 and and trying to get on about life as if nothing happened what if you sat down in a ceremonial way with a candle and a pie pan and um, a piece of paper and a pencil with the intention of looking at 16 beautiful Buddhist practices. Um, and they, they resonate in any culture or religion. Things like non-judgment, 
non-suffering, non-attachment, non -ju I love the quote by Ram Dass. We go out into the w woods and we look at the trees and some are tall and some are small and some are crooked and some are this and some are that and we don't judge them. But when it comes to people, ah, that judging mind comes in. And so sitting in ceremony, sitting in a ceremonial way, we're actually accessing a different part of the brain instead of in our basic everyday fight or flight kind of physical brain, we're up leveling to our ceremonial brain to the neocortex. And when you get to the neocortex and you're sitting in ceremony and you're breathing and you're actually communicating with spirit and you're writing down all these things, who are you judging? Judging yourself? Yeah, a lot of times we run from that. Judging your sister, your mother, your brother, your aunt, your uncle, things that you would never want to say to anybody. But you can sit with radical honesty and write these things on a piece of paper and burn them it is tremendously, tremendously healing. And sometimes you're judging your loved one. People would say to me things like, he's in a better place. And finally, I got so annoyed and I wanted to scream, but I'm not. I'm not in a better place. And I'm really kind of mad at him for being in a better place. That was not the game plan, right? And so, um, yeah, so we, you know, it's, it's sitting and looking deeply, deeply, deeply at places where we can release energy. That's sort of the shamanic path is we let go of heavy energy judgments, things like that. And we open our heart to bring in peace and loving kindness to ourselves, to the world. So we're, we're all, these exercises are like breathing, breathing out and breathing in. And we want to do this in preparation so we can find out where we are stuck. Everybody's stuck somewhere different. It could be a story you're telling yourself that's making you suffer. I know I had stories. Okay, I sent him to the wrong school. He had the wrong friend. He had the wrong this. I should have done this. I should have done that. We go crazy in our minds, ruminating, writing them all down and releasing those stories is tremendously clarifying because most of the time we want to push them out of our mind, push them out of our mind. Try, and we spend a lot of our energy pushing, 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 trying not to look at this, avoid that, not see this. But if you can sit in a ceremonial way and really look at it all with the intention of releasing, it's tremendously healing. And so what, you're, what you've been alluding to for the past couple of minutes is something you actually advocate, uh, which is these different ceremonial practices that help yeah. one get unstuck. And uh, people might have wondered why you mentioned pie, pl pie pan. Um, oh, and right. that's, that's because there's something... <laughs> a stage of the ceremony where you burn something and you want yes. something to catch the ashes. Yes, so, correct. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So smoke, smoke is sort of a, a way of releasing to spirit. And we, we, we can kind of tap into that. If we go into a church or a Buddhist temple and there's places where you can light a candle, people are, it's almost like you have this automatic desire to light the candle. Right. And so smoke and fire is a way shamans say for rapid transformation, but it's a way, no matter what religious practice you have that for release, releasing and communicating and talking with spirit in a ceremonial way is, is, um, is such a beautiful precursor to, to anything we try to do in life before we jump in. Yeah. And sometimes people complain you know, about back gap interviews that I'm talking about subjects like this, which aren't all the ultimate truth. You know, it's not mm. Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta or something. And um, my answer is that, um, you know, if you're referring to that particular tradition, um, Vedanta means the end of the Veda, but those who espouse it don't say that all the rest of the Veda was useless. Uh, and the rest of that whole body of knowledge has, contains all kinds of things that are somewhat um, similar to the kinds of things you're talking about and other traditions do as well. So there are all kinds of things that are, have relative significance and value um, that help people in various ways and that have um, evolved through the ages and, and proven useful. Um, anyway, yeah, I just wanted to make that. Yeah. Point. There's, um, you know, many paths to the top of the mountain yeah. And many ways to get there. And sometimes people, we have to take the steps. We can't, we can't quantum leap to the top of the mountain and become, you know, totally enlightened. We have to take these steps. And so this is a way of taking steps for people who are deeply sunk in grief, something that they can 
understand and grasp without having to completely embrace any tradition. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> um, so let's go back into your life a little bit more. So uh, you were, uh, we've, we've skimmed over some of it. You, you, you outlined this in great detail in the book. And it was a very well-written book, by the way. I, I thought it was, oh, thank you. It was very interesting. It's, and it's funny because you had all these hangups about not being able to write a book. Right. Um, but you, you wrote a pretty good one. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> which one would, not, which is not too surprising, get, considering your education was very good and you're, you're a very intelligent person who did well throughout your education. So piece of a uh, piece of pie, I guess, um, to, to have written. No, a good one. it wasn't that it wasn't that easy, but I, I felt like it was guided. Yeah, in so yeah. many ways. My journey was guided. You yeah. know, do you feel that your whole law school, your, your whole law episode for 30 years was also guided? Or do you, do you yeah. wish you could have? Do you ever sort of think, oh, if I only did this, I could have shortcutted right all to the spiritual stuff. But do you look at it now as all 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 is well and wisely put? Yeah, so it, 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 I use a lot of things now in my spiritual life and practice that I gathered those tools in my legal practice, ways of looking at things and putting things together and a analyzing things. And so I think it was all ultimately helpful. I think it was also ultimately helpful to have regrets and look back and say, wow, that was really hard. Being the sandwich generation, having um, young children, raising them, all those experiences. Wow, I'm so glad I had them all. And so that I can be relatable to people. You know, people yeah. can come to me and talk about their grief and grieving and their life issues. And I go, yeah, I get it. I get that. I might not have had I found a spiritual path early on. Maybe I would have been not so um, compassionate. Yeah, I've heard spiritual teachers say that um, those who don't go through various trials and tribulations, and that, but then become teachers, are very often not very good at, at helping others who are going through such yeah. things. It, it, you become a more well-rounded teacher if you have been through, you know, some of these uh, these challenges yourself and and surmounted them or lived through them. You can relate to the people, obviously. I'm going to ask a question here. This came in from Bob Ralph in Whidbey Island, Washington. <clears throat> um, I was in Vietnam and then a cop and I found myself surrounded by death. I've had many die in my presence and give me a message for someone. Carrying that message and not knowing who it is for troubled me. Hmm. I guess he's saying that they gave him a message as they were about to die, like tell, tell Joe I love him or something. Um, and carrying it and not knowing it, who it is for troubled me. I'm not sure exactly what he means by that, but do you, what, do you, what would you say to that? So that's another place where we can sit in a ceremonial way uh, with fire going and have your intention that this message be transmitted to this the perfect person through the quantum field, through consciousness, however it is, so that you can release that, right? Because it's you're holding on to it um, in your heart and you're feeling like you can't fulfill it. But what if you could fulfill it in a different way, a different way through consciousness, through the collective consciousness, through whatever you want to call it, and and allow that message to go with your great intention. You know, sometimes I always tell my students, we don't know how powerful our intention is. Intention, intention, intention. And so if you sit in a meditative state and you have this intention for this message to be given, to be received, it will be received. It'll be received and, you know, just let it go. You don't, you know, love thing, the beauty about these spiritual practices, you don't even have to believe. You just have to do. Just let it go. And, 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 it, and it allows you that feeling of completion and it allows that message to be received and that person will get it wherever they are in this world or the next. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting point and i've heard others say that too that um those on the other side are not constrained so much as we are 
yeah. by time and space. And, um, you know, they can easily show up or tune in um, when we have an intention from our side. Um, and I think that that would also apply to some of the really high beings, you know, all these people who have experiences with Jesus or Ramana Maharshi or something, you know, and, and it's a lot of people all over the world that are having these ex experiences. But, you know, I, I suppose, you know, if we, if those beings are what they're, they're said to be, then, um, you know, they have a, a much more omniscient way of functioning than human beings can possibly have and can actually respond or interact um, with a whole lot of people all over the place, just on the basis of the person having thought something or felt something. Yeah, for sure. You know, that, that power of prayer and the prayer um, in the Asceni way where you pray as though it's already done. Yeah, yeah. Right? So thank you for doing this for me. So thank you for sending this message for me. Thank you for taking it where it needs to go through space time. Yeah. So that you can feel a little lighter and complete your mission. You know, we like to complete our missions, <laughs> especially military people. I get the military mind, you know, you got to complete that mission. And so, yeah. So we haven't totally told the story of your son's death yet. Um, so, you know, you, you had this career, you were a very busy woman um in a very you know prestigious position making good money living in, in the dc suburbs and uh working your ass off <laughs> <laughs> um barely seeing daylight ever because you, you when you drove to work it was dark when you drove home it was dark right possibly even in the summer i don't know right. um <laughs> and uh you know I'm, I'm just summarizing some things really quick um well, maybe I should let you do it. I, I read your whole book, so I'm quite familiar with it. But why don't you tell us some of the highlights of how your life had been going and uh, and what kind of led up to this catastrophic moment of your son dying? Sure. Yeah, my son Ben. Even when he was born, he was uh, he, he was overdue. He was like three weeks overdue, and when he was born. Um, it was a big crisis. The doc, he had. Let me just tell you one quick thing. I've heard over the years that highly evolved souls often have longer gestation periods. They're they're often born late. I don't know if that's true, but it, some some traditional sources say that. Oh, interesting. I hadn't heard that. Yeah. But yeah. So he was late, and then there was losing. They were losing his heartbeat, and so it had to be an emergency C-section, and you know all the trauma, trauma, trauma. I I felt later like. He kind of knew what he was in for and maybe he didn't want to come in and he really had a, a diff many difficulties learning yeah one time the psychologist would say he he dances to the beat of a different drummer and i'm like well, what am i supposed to do with that how, how am i going to get him to dance to the drummer i don't get it right so um but he was very different had learning difficulties and really was kind of uh, in his own world uh, many times and so that was one aspect of, of him not being fully engaged in this realm. And, you know, of course, his parents were, we were always pushing, pushing, pushing. You got to do this. You got to do this. You got to do better. You got to go here. You got to do that. He wasn't particularly interested in sports. He wasn't particularly so push, push, push. And it didn't really work very well. And then in his teenage years, um, he wanted to play football and he had the physical and the doctor noticed there was something odd with his spine. And so it ended up that he ended up with a hunchback and possibly it was Marfan's disease, but um, he ended up with um, surgery. So the hunchback didn't even develop until he was in his teens. In his teens, not that we noticed. Right. Okay. Right. Then it became very noticeable. And then it was years of finding the right doctor and figuring out what to do and then scheduling this terribly terrifying surgery where they put two 17 inch rods in his back and the, you know, it was, it was huge. And, um, the surgery took 12 or 14 hours. And so when he woke up, he stopped breathing on and off. And it, it was just, it was just terrifying, just terrifying. And, um, and then he had to go to finish in an alternative school. And so just a lot of trauma and drama and him asking, he wanted to be in the military. I was in the military. His dad was in the military at one point. He wanted to go in the military. Well, of course, they weren't going to take him with all this back issue. And then he got very angry. He said, well, I'll go to the 
I'll go be a mercenary. I'll go change and you know, study in France and I'll be a mercenary. Well, you know, that's not going to go so well either because of the physical issue. And so he was just very angry, 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 and then began drinking a lot and hanging out with people and really lost himself, really was lost, refused to go to college, really brilliant guy, um, just just really angry, brilliant, angry, angry, brilliant guy. And then he kind of found this group of Primerica and began to learn about finance and selling life insurance and these kind of things. And I was always hoping... Uh, he might find a what girlfriend, he would get this good job, and he, things would settle for him. We're always hoping, hoping, hoping. And, and I think a lot of people that have, are living with children who are addicts or, or any of that, you know, as parents, we take on this tremendous burden, hoping at every moment, living in fear, hoping that something good will happen, something will be life changing. And they won't be an addict anymore. They won't, you know, they'll, they won't be angry anymore. They won't be frustrated anymore that something, a miracle will happen. And so, um, I, Ben had, that Primerica had really worked out. He, we didn't have enough. The insurance time. company. He was yeah. The working, insurance yeah. company didn't really work out very well. She d couldn't make a lot of money at it. We didn't have enough contacts of people for him. And so, um, he decided he was going to quit that and go try to go to college. And he did that. And I knew he was struggling. And But I was going to go off on this vacation. And I thought, oh, okay, I'll talk to him after I get back. We're going to have this big conversation. And I'm going to ask all the right questions and see where he is and what we can do. And of course, that never happened. So while I was on vacation, I get a call. And I hadn't felt very well that afternoon. I just felt really ill. And um, I got a call and the person hung up. And so I called back that number. I said, who is this? And they said, detective so-and-so. And I said, what's the matter? Well, it's your son. What happened? Is he an accident? I thought maybe he got a DWI or, you know, something like that. He's dead. He's, you know, where are you? I'm in Korea. Oh, okay. Well, they didn't want to tell me over the phone. So, um, and then of course, night is day, day is night. It took me 12 hours to get a flight home and then another 12 hours on the plane. And so it was just a long, long period of time of trauma and sadness and despair and hopelessness. And, um, and then, but you know, like I said, he came to me at the airport while I was waiting for my flight home. Um, he appeared in front of me and that was my first inkling, like, Oh my gosh. So he's not alive physically, but there's some part of him that's still around. So when you were a little girl, you had perceptions like that of the yes. fairies and stuff. Had you had any since you were a little girl or was this your first one since then? I think that was really the first one. I mean, I would definitely, if, they, if I went to a home or something and I would just feel like, oh, but, oh, there's some bad spirits here and I would just leave. Oh, there's bad energy here. Oh, I don't like this. I don't know. I would say bad energy, but I said, oh, there Picked up must be something. there must be a ghost here. I might yeah. have said <laughs> right, but I didn't see, sense, no, hear, see it in the sense that I might have before. Okay, yeah, I was just curious. Um, so this is a, in a way, it was sort of like the reintroduction of interaction with some subtler reality, yeah. you know, that that um, started the minute your son died. Yeah. Yeah. It totally was. And I think it just, the, the, the death was so shocking and it was so traumatic. And I think, you know, I was just awakened to these other realms again. I, whatever I had shut down, whatever thing I had closed off, burst open. And suddenly there I am able to see, sense, hear, know, um, over time, especially. Yeah. Um, yeah. So what are some other things along those lines that... Um you know, you, you flew home and obviously you were in a very bad state, very, very grief stricken and unhappy. Yeah. But, but as you were going through that, was there um, kind of a continuing stream of these what, what unusual experiences happening? Yeah, I could feel him around me. Like I could, it felt like he was fluttering, like fluttering, fluttering, fluttering around me. Like he was frantic. I was frantic, you know, I was, I was in really bad shape and, um, and I ended up actually going to a medium because I wanted to hear what he was saying because I felt him around me, but I couldn't hear anything. Right. And so that was sort of a beginning for me to get involved in more and more spiritual things, Kabbalah and, and spiritual, you know, mediumship, all, all sorts of things because I really wanted to talk to him. 
I wasn't so interested in anything else. But as I opened up to seeing, sensing, hearing him, then there came a point when I could see, sense, hear other spirits. And so one time I, I remember waking up in my bedroom and there were a whole lot of spirits around my bed. And I remember sitting up and going, no, 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 everybody out, everybody out of my room. It's party it's, time. <laughs> yeah, it's party time. You know, they all want to talk. They want to relate their story or they want to get, have messages and all that. So, and I was shocked they left. And then I could see spirits in the hallway and different places. I'm like, okay, everybody out of my house, everybody out of my house. So this is before I had any shamanic training. I had no idea how to deal with this or help these people, um, these spirits. And so, uh, so that, but, but I was led to exactly the right person, an evolutionary astrologer. As I recall, when you told that story in the book, um, Ben was somehow involved, like he had brought a group of his friends there to, right, to right, see, right. see if mom could help him or something. Yeah, right, right, right. It was sort of a group of young men who, young men and women that had passed over. So I was thinking about the story you were telling about the priest and the same thing. I, um, often help, um, young people or older people that have, Suicide. Suicides often get stuck because our heads are so filled with this idea that it's a sin and you're going to go to hell. So they cross over and they go, oh, I don't want to go anywhere. I'm going to stay right here yeah. because I'm afraid I'm going to go somewhere bad. And so this is where Ben and I can kind of work together. And he's like, okay, man, don't worry about it. Um, come with me. I'll show you the ropes. And, and it's, only, it's only really cool stuff over here. And so we, we kind of work together to help transition souls. Yeah. Um... Have you gotten, I mean, I have the feeling that there are all kinds of specialists on the other side, you know, who are doing different things. Some are guardian angels, maybe, and some are people who usher people who have just died to where they're supposed to go. And some perhaps are in the place that they're going to, and, and they serve there as teachers who are sort of helping to instruct people. Yeah. Um, and what they need to learn. And, and there are probably dozens, hundreds of different jobs, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and all these different levels of creation. And there are different levels, at least according to the Indian tradition, there are 14 of them, 14 locas, seven higher, seven lower. But um, I just have the feeling that the universe is, you know, it's not just um, big on our dimension it's big in terms of multi-dimensions yeah and there's uh, just hosts of beings serving all kinds of functions that we can't even possibly imagine yeah yeah beautiful beings on so you know they talk about psychopomps that's the name for some of the spirits that work to help transition souls and they're in between and that seemed to be their function they seem to have that role of helping spirits to transition and then there are the archangels and then the guides and spirits and your soul pod and your celestial parents and uh, parents that have been with you through every incarnation. Can you imagine that? That love you unconditionally, unconditionally and they help you help guide your incarnations and your um, your karma, karmic. Are you saying you have the same parents in every incarnation or are there some celestial whole... parents? The celestial, same... yes. Uh, yeah. Beings Spiritual. on the other side mm -hmm. who stick same with being. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. So there's a lot going on in the other side. There's a lot of beings. There's a lot happening. And it's kind of, it's fun to visit there. It's fun for me. I like being there. And I've sort of developed this ability to go there. Yeah. I just kind of sort of leave this plane and I can enter that dimension and work with spirits there and work with spirits that have just recently passed or passed that need some help. They are a little bit stuck. Yeah, that's interesting. <clears throat> um. I imagine that your being open to these other realities has not in any way um, depreciated your ability to function in, in this level of, of reality. Uh, it's probably just broadened it out and made you more sort of multifaceted, multi-talented, wouldn't you yeah. say? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that equation E equals MC squared, right? Energy, matter. matter. So shamans kind of dance on the equal sign. We're constantly going between the world of matter and energy, matter and energy. So, so it becomes, it's difficult in the beginning. I think people have a, a tough time. They say, oh, I, I don't want to come back down to earth, right? Or I want to stay there. And then after a while you realize it's all, 
it's all perfect you know it's all one spot here there everywhere time space time is a pretzel it loops around and and quantum physics has confirmed so much of this and we're just we're just we're going in and out of different dimensions someone said 3,000 times a day we just don't know it huh. we think we're right here all the time right we're right here but we're not we're there we're somewhere else we're in a past life we're in a former life we're in this realm we're in another realm and so I think after a while if you're open to it and you open up to that you just kind of accept that that's sort of your own different reality yeah some say that when we sleep at night and dream we mm. we travel a lot absolutely yeah the ancients ancient shamans ancient people of all time knew that dream time was really special that we're able to so we're able to let go of, you know our ego a lot of times keeps us down it keeps us safe right so don't do this don't do that stay here stay in our little fear box here and every time we get close to the edges ooh, it's unsafe unsafe don't do it don't do it right and so then we go beyond the edges and we go beyond the edges and once we go beyond the edges we kind of transcend fear and we transcend that egoic self that is so fearful and small and become I think what we're truly meant to be sort of multi-dimensional beings who have access to different realms at different times when needed as needed um, a nice uh, set of questions came in from Kristen in Chicago uh, three different questions okay um, here we go so would you say that subtle phenomena are inherently any more valuable or trustworthy than gross phenomena Wow, subtle phenomena as opposed to gross phenomena. I yeah, don't know. Which is I mean, kind of just what we were just talking about here. I mean, right? You know, yeah, yeah, subtle phenomena. I think are. I think that maybe more reliable. Maybe even I'm not sure how she would define make define those terms: gross phenomena versus subtle phenomenon. But I think sometimes we want to we want to look for the big ones. We want to look for big confirmations. But sometimes the information we get is like a whisper. Um, it's like it's like it's a it's a moment it's not a it's not a video and so once we can begin to rely on those subtle 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 phenomena our world expands tremendously because you know it's our mind our mind is trying to interpret energy interpret whatever's around us and so sometimes it doesn't interpret it it only gets a little glimpse it only gets a little whisper but as we tune in and we accept those glimpses and whispers, our, our world expands, our knowledge expands. One thing that her question brings to my mind is that um, I think as we become more attuned to subtle phenomena, at the same time, we have to counterbalance that with being grounded and integrated and, and also perhaps developing critical thinking skills. Um, because like, you mentioned in your book you went to some kind of psychic fair someplace mm -hmm. and i think if i were to go to a thing like that and walk around i would think all right this is all very interesting but a lot of these people are really kooky and <laughs> and really out there and have overactive imaginations and uh and in fact i mean when you know the pandemic struck and the QAnon phenomena um came um a large percentage of people who had a spiritual or, or orientation dove right into that. I, I had friends and yeah. I have friends in Sedona who said that, you know, perhaps three quarters of the people they knew, the spiritual types in Sedona were into QAnon and had swung way to the right politically, uh, yeah. which is part of the QAnon deal. So, you know, my, my feeling is these people perhaps had very active imagine, imaginary lives in, in the, in the spiritual sense, but hadn't really grounded it in, in practicality and hadn't developed critical thinking skills and discernment, which I think is really important on the spiritual path. Yeah. So we often talk about, you know, the, the really, uh, the spiritual ones, oh, excuse me, uh, the spiritual ones who have live in these uh, fantastic cities in the clouds and live in, and live in their car. So they, <laughs> right, can't, right, right. Right? they can't bring it down to reality. And so QAnon gave people a, a reality, something to believe in, something to tune into, a community to be part of. You know, I think we all want to be part of a community. And, and um, so 
that was the sort of the perfect storm with um, the financial issues and the pandemic, all of that. People were isolated and alone and looking for some community. And, and so there they were promising all the answers. Here's the answers and we can be a community and we're all together and we believe this stuff. And um, so, yeah, that's, that, that kind of, that really can happen when people become very isolated. And isolation leads to being ungrounded, as yeah. you're talking about. Mm-hmm. There's a term, conspirituality. I don't know if you've heard that Conspiritual, term. I haven't, but that's a good one. Yeah. That's a good one. I've actually, there's a podcast by that name, and I, I've interviewed the guys who do that podcast, but it's all about how the, the spiritual community got really into conspiracy theories and, you know, anti-vax and the whole deal. Yeah. Um, all right. And. I always get negative feedback when I say these things because some of the people listening to this actually think that way, but I'm sorry. That is what it is. All right. Here's another question from Kristen. Um, Does spiritual awakening require sensitivity to the subtle and astral realms? Well, I don't know. All I know is my experience. My experience was, um, yes, I had some experiences early on, but I was very closed down and it took a big event to awaken me. So did I have some... Kind of broke sensi- you open. Right. So maybe I had some sensitivities that were kind of lingering from the past, but at the same time, they were very closed down. So I think it's entirely possible for people to go from zero to 120, right? I think they can be like nowhere and have a spiritual awakening. Mm-hmm. I don't think it always requires years and years of study and and years and years of of practice and all those things, sometimes people just kind of quantum leap into a practice. Uh, Yeah, I wouldn't say that spiritual awakening requires sensitivity to subtle and astral realms, but it may very well um, open that up. It may very well precipitate such sensitivity. It certainly wouldn't hurt. It doesn't yeah. hurt to be open to it. Anything you're open to make is a is a lot more possible and probable than things you're not. Yeah. Also, another point is that you know some people are very awake spiritually, but they just don't have a lot of sort of astral perception, celestial perception, that kind of thing, whether by choice or whether they just happen to be wired that way. Um, and I don't know that they that that's necessarily an indicator of any lack of of development. It's, it just could could perhaps be an aptitude that may or may not get developed. It could be the aptitude or it could be not having access to the right teacher. Could be. Yeah. I think a good guru is so important. They can expose you to things and thoughts and ways of viewing the world that you might not come up with. You might not come across on your own research or might not come across on your own. So I think I certainly, you know, the four winds and shamanism opened up in a big way. I had a lot to hang on to, a lot conceptually, and a lot of practices that I could tune into and develop my spiritual my spiritual perceptions and growth. Yeah. But not all gurus. I mean, you, you were in a, a shamanic tradition, which is really into this subtle perception stuff, but not all gurus would want to teach that to their students. That Some would say, that that's a distraction or not really essential and you know, keep your eye on the goal. Um, right, d- right. Don't, don't get hung up with this stuff. Yeah. So I think, you know, you got to, like I said, there's many paths to the top of the mountain. You got to find, walk your own path. Yeah. What's right for you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Third question from Kristen. When you say that on some level, you chose to have this experience, presumably she means the whole experience with Ben. Um, who exactly is this you that did the choosing? Yeah, that's such a great question. So is this my, um, you know, I call it the observer or within, is this my soul being? Is it my um, consciousness? I, higher I don't, self. My something. higher self. Yeah, it's, is, is that where this happened? You've got some great cosmic tea party where we sat down and, and hammered this out with our soul pod and, and everything. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so it's some part of us that's eternal. And I, I do believe there is some part of us, some subtle part of us that is eternal. And that part is doing all kinds of things in between lives and, 
you know, not everybody believes in reincarnation, and that's okay too. And maybe there isn't. Maybe it's not reincarnation. Maybe we incarnate, reincarnate many times in this lifetime. I feel like I've had lived several lives in this time. That's true. You've worn many hats. I've worn many hats. So maybe, maybe that's uh, maybe that's it. Uh, you know, they say um, hell is here on earth, or or heaven is here on earth, and maybe that's it. And so when you go over, your higher self is. Yeah, off in other realms doing other things and not yeah. earthbound. Some say that, um, you know, three quarters or so of our, of who we are, of our soul, or whatever you want to call it, isn't in this body. It is, or it's still even now on some higher level. And then in fact, you know, it could incarnate simultaneously in a couple of different bodies, portions of it. Um, yeah. It's all fun to play with. I mean, I it's all fascinating. Yeah, I don't it's know for sure about any of this stuff, but <laughs> but I, I really that I mean, you know, I'm not afraid of death anymore. That's the big thing. Yeah, I'm not afraid thing. of death anymore, and I can't wait to find the answers to these questions because I have lots of questions. <laughs> I'm going to be asking a lot of questions on the other side and looking around and saying, "Oh, so that's how it all worked." Oh, yeah. okay. Like, like Disneyland, like kid like in Dis Disneyland for you. Yeah. Oh, Oh, I did that? Wow, okay. <laughs> right. Right. <clears throat> um, back to the, the, the point about the Texas school shooting. This is from Mohan Rao in Cookville, Tennessee. He's asking, um, I don't know, if, well, how can you explain to a parent from last week's Texas school shooting that their son or daughter chose death for the purpose of teaching someone a lesson? You can't. Yeah, I don't think I would. I wouldn't even try it. Yeah. You know, this is something they may come to um in a later they may find some way to find meaning in their child's death that is not apparent right now and so and that's isn't that the wisdom of everything is it's not always apparent at the moment but in time things are revealed to us um, in a way that we can understand and comprehend hopefully and internalize yeah and if not during life, then again, like you say, after we cross over, um, yeah, you know, let's say some of those parents just grieve their entire life without any res resolution or, or relief. And then when they pass, I'll be darned. Here's my child, you know, here yeah. to greet me or something like that. Right. For sure. For sure they'll be there. And for sure they're there now. And for sure it's all happening at the same time. And it's all entangled. Yeah. I have some really good friends who are very skeptical. Um, I interviewed one of them, Tom Christofiak, and I can just imagine him listening to this conversation and <laughs> feeling like, you know, all oh, this, it's just imaginative, wishful thinking. Why do people do this? You know, what, what do they get out of this? Um, and I sometimes, I actually get into extended conversations with him and some other friends who are like that. And um, it always fascinates me about, you know, why we believe what we believe and, um, and, and what is it, you know, the way I've come to terms with it is that um, I regard beliefs as like hypotheses. And like a lot of things you and I are talking about today, uh, I don't feel like I'll be damned if I don't believe them uh, or, you know, saved if I do believe them. I feel like these are ways of looking at the world that seem to make a lot of sense to me. And there seems to be a lot of evidence for them. Um, but can I know with absolute certainty that it's this way? The, uh, no, but it's like, you know, a scientist doesn't know anything with absolute certainty. He's, he just keeps building evidence and maybe, and he's open to the possibility that at some point he'll have to revise his, his hypothesis because the evidence doesn't support it. Right. Right. And I, I think it's just, a lot of it is experiential. You know, how, how do we experience the world? I certainly experienced it many different ways over my lifetime. And so I'm here at this point because of my recent experiences over the last seven or eight years. Um, and I look at Anita Morjani and life after death and um, near death experiences. Wow, you know, not everybody believes that either. They just think, oh, that's just the chemical function of the brain shutting down and, and blah, blah, blah. And there's all kind of science for believing that way. And, and yet there's science in, experience that shows it to be very different and our brains yeah. to be very different i mean in terms of near-death experiences which often involve out-of-body experiences people have all kinds of uh things that 
are impossible to explain. They're they're in a coma, they're under anesthesia, and yet they're perceiving things, you know, down the hall or up on the roof or yeah. or, or whatever that are later verified that they had no way of knowing. So, and the you know, how can anyone explain that other than that? we must have the ability to function outside the range of our physical body somehow. Yeah. And look at Dr. Joe Dispenza, you know, healing his back right. through visualization and meditation. And so there are people that, you know, really work in those, those ways too for healing. And I don't know how it all works, but it does seem to work. Um, it does seem to have a uh, look at um, Lynn um, Tag McTaggart, um, the experiments with um, power of eight healing groups, the intentionality of it through time and space, and people seem to have miraculous recoveries with the group of eight people meditating for their wellness. Uh, there's a study that talks about, um, gosh, uh, a scientific study that was done uh, with a control group that was prayed for and, and any other control that wasn't prayed for. You probably know that study. I've Maybe you've heard of it. Yeah. And, and so the beauty with the, the group that was prayed for had better results. But the twist on it was the group that was prayed for had been released from the hospital 10 years earlier. And the same thing for the group that hadn't been prayed for. So it just talks about how we affect the past through our intention and our prayers huh. as well as not just the future but the past as well so this entanglement of the peasant past and future is being supported by quantum physics so there is some good science for much of this yeah um time is very malleable and very uh, very much dependent upon the velocity of the observer yeah for sure. So, you know, science, the way we knew science um, has been changing radically. I mean, the scientific papers come out on a weekly basis. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just amazing, the new science and how science is, is observing the, the world and, and how the world works. And, and so what we knew about things 10 years ago is so different than, than what they're observing and discovering now. So it's fascinating. It's really, truly fascinating how it supports really the ancients and the ancient scrolls and the ancient texts and the, so many, so much of the ancients that knew things, um, they knew them, but they didn't have the science. And so for me, with my logical mind, I like having the science. I like being able to go, oh, look at that experience, spir scientific experiment proving, oh, that's how it works. It really does work. Um, it works with the quantum field. And so. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good. I, I I really enjoy the science spirituality interface also, and I've I've yeah. been, interviewed a lot of people in that realm, like Dean Radin and others, and David Lorimer. And I've got Bernard Carr coming up. He in in August. He he was a student of Stephen Hawking. Oh and, yeah, amazing. He's the president of uh, the Scientific and Medical Network over in England, which has a very active group that has speakers all the time on the kinds of topics you and I are talking about, but they're really trying to sort of um, integrate sci yeah. science and spirituality. Yeah, that's what they call that, metaphysics, I think. Yeah, you could say that. Metaphysics, yeah. I personally like that because it made it easier for me to accept this big change in my perception in my life after my son passed. Otherwise, I think I would have really thought I had just cracked up. Yeah. Right. So I had a, I had a context. I had a scientific context and I had experience. And so I was okay. I could be okay with it. I could have the experiences I was having and say, okay, a lot of this is being ex supported by science. And I'm, I'm just working in the quantum field and, and whatever that, whatever the field is, however you see it, if you see it as all these dimensions, the 17 dimensions, the 10 dimensions, <laughs> the, all the, however you see it. And, and, you know, it's so interesting. I love talking to, um, all, everybody that has to deal with religious scholars of any kind, any, because they kind of entrain. If you look, Christians see a world in the same way and they see the cosmology in the same way and, and the, um, Indians see it in one way, Indians see it in one way, and so and it, it's interesting, the Buddhists see it in one way because they kind of entrain together, their minds entrain together, and, and they, they build and they build and they build on what they have, and it's, it's fantastic to see 
the differences and the similarities of people who spend their lives looking at the metaphysical and the spiritual. Yeah, there are differences and there are commonalities, like you said. Yeah. Um, perennial philosophy. I mean, there there are certain themes which show up in cultures all over the world, including cultures that had no way of communicating with each other. Um, so, which you know suggests that there is some universal truth that we all tap into, um, even though we might express it differently according to yeah. the culture we're, that we're living in. For sure, absolutely, mm. yeah. We haven't talked much about your whole shamanic training yet. I mean, you, um, after you kind of uh, eventually got your wheels turning again and, and quit your job and sold your house and all this stuff, you had the freedom and the finances to travel the world. And you did just that. You were Africa and India and South America, and Easter Island and all over the place. Bangladesh. And Bangladesh. <laughs> um, John of God. John of God. Oh, yeah. yeah. There's a whole John, John of God tra chapter. And, yeah. And yeah. For fortunately, also a little sub note about that because yeah. that kind of went sour. Um, but, um, and, and there were also like some things which you pursued, like the Lakota tradition, which ended up being, you know, a good thing, but not your thing. And yeah. so you, so you particularly, um, your main thing was this study with Alberto, was it? Yeah, Alberto Viodo. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and what you do now with people for mm -hmm. people um, is it mainly an ex a reflection of the training you received with him? Yeah, it's okay. a, it's a big reflection. He had a big impact on my life and has been a really positive mentor and trained me specially with him. Um, but, you know, as with anything else, we all have our individual um, interpretations to bring to things. Things come to me in a way, working with people on the other side that that may not be how other shamans would, would do it. So we all have, you know, the, the, the Andean shamans are, have a beautiful philosophy for this, that we're always adding to the medicine. We're always adding to the collective and to the medicine. And so our own medicine comes in specifically for us and how, how, how we work in this, in these realms. Yeah. So how do you work? I mean, what do you do with these, with people? Do you have retreats with in person? Do you do zoom calls? Do you do one-on-ones? Yeah. I mean, how, if, so, if a person were to sort of try to work with you, what would they do? Yeah. So um, visit my website, karenjohnson.net. And you'll see I have, um, um, I have individual um, consultations and we do Zoom. It's about an hour, hour and 15 minute sessions. Um, I do a lot of different things working with um, spirits of deceased um, relatives, despachos, which are really prayer bundles. Um, I help souls transition to the other side souls that are stuck, I can go look and see if you're worried about your relative and wanting to know where they are and if they're okay. I can track that for you. Um, and I have classes coming up. I do, it's a five week coming up. It begins July 10th. It's a five week class based on the practices in the book. And we work in community. I've had this class about three or four times now. And it's amazing how much healing comes through by people working in community. So the first class is basically, this is what we're going to do. And then the second class is working through the four practices of the south direction of the medicine wheel. So there's four directions in the medicine wheel, southwest, north, and east, and four practices related to each direction. And, and, and what is the medicine wheel? The medicine wheel is this, it's this really ancient idea. It's a circle. And, and in the circle, it's an energetic circle represented by archetypal animals, and it has healing practices associated with each direction. And so the healing practices that I am use are based on the Andean of Peru. Um, and so we begin in the south direction of the medicine wheel, and that's the archetypal energy there is great serpent serpent and we want to shed our past the way serpent sheds her skin and then we go to the west direction represented by jaguar jaguar medicine is dealing with the death within us you know so many of us are so afraid of death and dying and so we want to 
deal with the death within it and heal the death that lives within us. And then we go to hummingbird medicine. Hummingbird medicine has to do with finding our soul's journey uh, and drinking from the sweetest nectar of life and making that soul's journey back and forth. You know, these little hummingbirds go back and forth from Canada to Brazil with really, they're really tiny. They don't have any food. They, don't, they just trust and they go. And so you it's know, a metaphor. Some of them fly all the way from South America to Texas across the Gulf of Mexico in yeah. one thing. It's, a, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And so that, that's a metaphor for our journey with life. Sometimes we just have to go on, embark on that, that beautiful journey. And then eagle medicine is um, rising above everything, getting the big pic picture, the eagle eye, seeing how everything relates to everything else. And so we have practices associated with, with each one. Illumination, illumination. I love I love the medicine because it's it's. Um, I think it was Aristotle. I'll probably get this wrong. Said the universe abhors a vacuum. And so in shamanic medicine, we take out the heavy energies and we replace it, but with divine light. So we're always balancing, balancing, balancing and extracting you know a lot of times we pick up people gone to bars and gone to concerts and maybe had a few wild times in their their youth and, and sometimes we become open to energies and entities that are not so good and they kind of take resonance in us and getting rid of those is is can be very very healing um and then soul retrieval wow in the north direction when we have really traumatic experiences that happen to us a part of us flees and it's the healed part so most of us are walking around sort of like like Swiss cheese you know we have pieces of us missing and to retrieve those parts and become whole again is very healing yeah that reminds me of some of the Carlos Castaneda stuff I remember Don Juan saying that people would have holes in their luminosity yes holes in your luminosity that's the way I see it you know and bringing those parts back, you know. So we would do other healing practices first because you have to prepare the field to even um, for the for the soul to even want to become back to come back. So you know we do a lot of, of work on people's fields and energies, and and then the great death rites and the great death spiral and helping um, souls to cross over. Sounds like there's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of stuff. <laughs> it's a lot of stuff. It kept my mind very busy and very happily consumed with, with things. And then I, well, by the time I got to the east direction, and um, they were talking about helping spirits to cross over and helping s souls to transition and helping spirits um, that are stuck places, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's what I've been waiting for. Ah, oh, that's what I see. I see these spirits and I see that they need help. Ah, oh, now I can help them. So do you help them and do you help other people? Is, is this all ceremonial stuff? Um, or, and is it all stuff that they do with you or is it stuff they learn and then do on their own or what? So it's all, it's all done in sacred space. And meaning, this, what? meaning I open the four directions. I call in the energies of the Southwest, Northeast, Pachamama, the Mother Earth, Gaia, and Spirit. And you're so doing I'm this on a Zoom call or something? On a Zoom call, yeah. Okay. We open sacred space and I open it for the person. And then I open my Wiracocha. So, you know, the eighth chakra that you see above the Christ and the Buddha, mm -hmm. we all have that. And it's an energy that we can tap in and open around us. And I can open it and I can, I can put it over you, for example. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I can use it. <laughs> yeah, a little sacred space there. So we work within this sacred space. And, um, and then, you know, I can do a little journeying, chanting. I use medicine stones. I have a mesa, which is a, an altar that has 13 stones in it. And the stones represent my own healing journey on each direction. And so I put a stone on the chakra. And the idea is it's um, an alchemical process between the person's breath and the medicine stone. And I'm bringing their luminous energy field. So I can bring your luminous energy field. I can call it into me and bring it down in front of me. And I can work on your luminous energy field. Hmm. And I can, you know, put a kuya there. And many times people put a are like, what? a kuya, C-U-Y-A, it's a name for my medicine stone. Huh. Yeah. Um, so, and, and then so we begin this process with a person breathing 
and that alchemical process with the medicine stone transforming heavy energy. So it's not like I can tap you on the head and erase a memory, but we can take away some of the heaviness around it, some of the things, that, some of the trauma and the fear and the pain, we can release some of that. Some of the old stories, you know, we carry these stories. I, this happened to me, this really bad thing, and they carry it for the rest of your life, right? What if you could release some of that so that that story is a story, but it doesn't affect your decision making? It doesn't disrupt your daily life. So we want to prevent that bleed through from the past into the present. So that's how shamans work in all those dimensions, the past, the present, the future. Is most of, are most of these things uh, things that shamans in that tradition have been doing for hundreds of years? Yeah. So Alberto Viodo kind of translated things mm -hmm. and made them, as we call it neo-shamanism, and he right. in, in put in aspects of North American shamans and aspects of Buddhism, and so it's really a comprehensive sort of conglomerate uh -huh. <laughs> of practices. How, how long have you been actually practicing it uh, as a, in, a, in an instructive role now or a teacher role? Oh, gosh, I've been teaching since 2017. Okay, so yeah, about five so years. About five years, yeah. And your son died in, in 2014, 14. so it was like a three-year crash course when you were in there. Crash course. I was in it. I was in, I was <laughs> deep. When I was tra traveling the world, I had left my job, sold my house, all my art, all my furniture, everything was gone, given away, whatever, and I just had two suitcases and a carry-on uh, for two and a half years. And I really, I just couldn't comprehend grief and death. Why do we have to have death? Why do people die? How can this happen? How can this horrible thing happen? And I just couldn't grasp it. And I was looking for answers from spiritual teachers. You know, what is this about? How are we supposed to deal with grief? It's impossible. We can't. How can you ever get over it? How can you ever recover? What am I supposed to do? And so that was my journey to try to get answers to those kind of questions. So um, how many people have you had involved in courses, if you add them all up? Oh gosh, probably hey, by now. Puppy dog. It's Murphy. Murphy. Oh, I heard about he, Murphy. Yeah. He needed to be. <laughs> he likes to be part of everything. Um, probably thousands now. Wow, that's that's impressive. Yeah. And can you give us some examples of changes that people have undergone um, yeah. through their involvement? Oh gosh, so many things, life-changing things. People. Became, well, so the one one young man that I teach with now, um, he's not that young, but he's young compared to me. But <laughs> so he was, you know, a super um, uh, producer, technical person in soccer, big in sports and sports broadcasting, right? And so, but he always knew something was missing. Something was, why am I unhappy? Why am I standing in these stadiums feeling lonely and miserable? And then he found this path. And it changed his life. And so now he's teaching and um, helping other people and having sessions. Big life changes. I mean, sometimes the changes are looking at your own life and saying, is this my life or is this somebody else's life that I'm, I'm living? Did I choose this? Is this making me happy? Is this what I want? Or isn't it? And, and really asking the big questions so that you have the option of changing things or setting change in motion. I always say we don't have to jump off the cliff, right? Sometimes we just need a glide path, but at least you're asking the right questions. Am I doing this because my family expects me to? Am I living here because my family expects me to? Is this job what I even care about? Is there a way out? Can I do something different? If, and if I were going to do something different, what would I do? And that was a question that I asked myself, what would I do? And I got back in touch with my younger self that wanted to be an archaeologist and travel the world. And my parents told me, no, it's not safe. It's not safe. You know, so I was born in the 50s. And so I guess at that age, even in the 70s, when I went off to Afghanistan <laughs> as a Fulbright scholar, there were, was no internet. There was no, it was difficult to make international phone calls. There was no text and cell phones or any of that. So it was a whole different world and you could be really isolated and, and, and it could be unsafe, you know. So 
Um, I can see their concern, you know, with their only child, their little darling. And so I kind of did what I was expected. I went back to school and I um, got a couple master's degrees and then I got a law degree and, and then I just was a lawyer for 30 years and I did that. And I said, okay, I'm going to have the family and I'm going to have the children and I'm going to work this and I'm going to do everything that I can to be a good everything. Good mom, good wife, good worker, good, good, good. And yet there were times when I felt like the invisible woman. I remember one time where I, I thought, what if I, what if I just don't say anything for a day? Would anybody notice? Nope, nobody noticed. What if I dyed, I had blonde hair. What if I dyed my blonde hair red? It took three weeks for my husband to even notice. <laughs> and I thought, I'm just invisible. I've become completely invisible. And then thinking, what is that about? I just let everything go that was important to me and became whatever anybody else needed. You know, the sandwich generation. So we've got our parents and their needs, and we've got children and their needs, and we've got our husbands and spouses and mortgages and cars. And... <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah. And a lot of us are trapped in that. I always say, I don't remember my 40s. Ten years went by. I lost it. I don't remember what I did, where I went. I don't remember anything except being overwhelmed and exhausted. Well, I'm glad you got out of it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Of these, these years, I mean, um, it was not an easy way to get there. I mean, I would never choose losing Ben in that way, but he really did lead me to a very different life. So... I'm no longer in the second worst traffic in the country. I'm not practicing law. I live in a small town in upstate New York, and I write books and see clients, and I love it. I think it was Deepak Chopra who said, we're, we're human beings, we're not human doings. Right. You know, but you were a human doing there for a, a while. Human doing, yeah. <laughs> so doing, you know, that's such an interesting practice, non-doing, the practice of non-doing, because we became, most of us become super busy to avoid uncomfortable emotions. Mm. So an uncomfortable emotion comes up and you go, oh, well, you know, I really need to clean the oven, <laughs> right? I need to clean the car. I need to get gas. I need to go grocery shopping. I need, oh, well, you know, we can fill up entire weekends with doing, 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 busy, 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 and then really avoid like the plague, any sitting, never mind any meditation that might have uncomfortable feelings and emotions arise. So we've got this super highway that's going on between our gut brain and the brain in our head, right? So we've got this information super highway going, going, going. And, oh, you know, closing sh Shenpa, right? So we, we have Shenpa, we have all these things going on that begin in kind of in the gut, that pre-verbal sort of, uh-oh, uh-oh, I don't want to think about that, uh-oh, right? And so we get up to the brain, the brain says, oh, do something, do something, do something, let's go, let's get busy, let's get going, right? So it's really hard to sit, sit with that, Hit, sit with those uncomfortable emotions and not flee and not run and not be busy. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to break the habit, you know? Um, it is. I'm, I have a friend who uh, I'm encouraging to practice meditation regularly and um you know the, her her mind is so habituated to being active that it's she finds it very difficult to just sit you know what we'd, we'd rather be doing something yeah. and and not, maybe you know it's not I've, i kind of feel that maybe it's just making some kind of abrupt transition where you're just sitting for an hour or twice a day or some such thing is impossible for most people and not even desirable or advisory advisable. Um, we have to sort of start where we are and do what we can from there, but we can always do something. I think and yeah, you don't so want to just sort of be on the rat on the, the, what is those rat wheels that they run? Right, right, the hamster wheel. <laughs> hamster right, wheel. Right, right, the hamster wheel. Right, 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 the hamster wheel. You don't want to do that till the day you die. Um, and you don't necessarily want to have some tragedy or disease or accident or something jar you out of, uh, you know, that, that, that rat race. It's, it's better if you can somehow take steps before. There's a, there's a verse from the yoga, from, no, what is it? The yoga sutras, yeah, Patanjali. He says, avert the danger which has not yet come. 
Yeah. Well, what I like to suggest for people like that, especially for women, mm -hmm. um, there's a beautiful book by Perdita Flynn. It's called The Way of the Rose. And it really talks about beads and chanting and how women use their hands, right? And the grandmothers, the grandmothers would pray with beads. Um, and, and in the book, she says, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the Dalai Lama. I want to be my grandmother. And sometimes chanting, um, praying with beads, saying a, a mantra over and over, girl, that's a doorway into quieting the mind. That's what works for me. I can't just sit down and go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm in this other. <laughs> I, I can't. I just, I just need that doorway. So the Gayatri mantra, 108 times of saying the Gayatri mantra, I'm in a different place. Sure. I'm in a different space time. So I think sometimes people need that, that, that idea of sitting on a cushion and just following your breath and, and not your thoughts and worrying about the, you know, it's just, it's too much. It's too yeah. hard. Right. And maybe it was meant for men. You know, that's her philosophy is this idea that meditation really came from the difference between men's roles and women. Men had to sit as hunters quietly and silently in the forest for great periods of time, where women were more hunter and gatherers. So they're busy and so they do things in a different way. And maybe we're, you know, our brains are a little different. Could be. I know plenty of women who are good meditators, but um, men or women, it's also a tradition thing to, to do japa with beads. Um, yeah and uh, 108 beads or whatever and you're doing a mantra or whatever but you're you're not just you, there's some external um, activity of counting on the on the mala yeah um or some people have these little rings that have these little tabs on them and they kind of go yeah. along i even had a friend who just carried around a, a clicker all day and counted how many times she did her mantra um yeah. So I don't know, different strokes for different folks. And I think it's like using that, I think that's a great, it's an entry, yeah. right? It's a, it's a great entry. It's sort of like, you know, getting ready for bed at night. I brush my teeth and then I do this and I do that. So for me, it's like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to chant. I'm going to do this. And then when I'm done, oh, I'll be able to, I'll be in this meditative state. And I don't have to fight it. I don't have to force it. I don't have to, you know... Um, try to contain my busy mind. It just kind of happens organically. When you do the Gayatri mantra, are you like sitting in your meditation room or will you do it on a, on a hike or something like that? Oh, I could do it on a hike. I can sit in my front porch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So walking meditations, I, I like that much better than being confined to one spot, one space. Although I, I kind of do have my little meditation spot now that I rather like, but it took me a while and I, and I think that's it. I mean, I think we have to reach people where they are and not try to force them into a way that, that they are not able to do. So I always, people always told me that I was um, bi, not bipolar. Um, oh, what's it called when you have the busy mind and you have learning uh, issues? Dyslexic? Bis no. Not dyslexia, the um, ADHD. ADHD, okay. ADHD. Attention Hyper, deficit. Yeah, attention mm -hmm. deficit. So, so maybe some of us, you know, they say everybody has a little bit of everything. We're all a little attention deficit, a little bipolar, a little schizophrenic. We all have crazy, it. It's, yeah. it's all a little crazy. It's just how much. And so maybe some of us just need a little different entry. Yeah. And that's okay. No, I agree with that. I mean, look at what I do with this interview show. It's just people are all over the map in terms of the kinds of spiritual practices and traditions and everything that they have been doing. And I wouldn't be able to do this show if I thought that everybody was supposed to be doing the same thing. Yeah. Um, or else I'd be a real lousy interviewer. <laughs> you know. It would get really boring after a while. Yeah, it would. This way and there's no other way. <laughs> right. Um, and look at the way God rolls. I mean, you know, look at the incredible diversity and variety in creation um all the different kinds of plants and animals and flowers and all this all this stuff is just mind-boggling so you know in a, in a in terms of spirituality why should everything be the same right well same thing with people why should we all be the same yeah isn't it we, great that everybody is so uniquely different yeah no and two so faces alike no two phases alike and different customs and different cultures and different races and different oh everything it's like i'm fascinated by it all it's just fascinating so um why not be that way with spirituality too it's just it's fascinating to me yeah <laughs> i have a friend who um 
has a really good microscope and he he goes out and collects pond water and just oh. you know looks at the, all the little critters in pond water and he said it's like i forget the analogy he used but he said it's like going to disneyland or something it's just there's just a, it, it's almost like he said you know whoever created these little critters has a sense of humor because they're, they're just so amusing sometimes but when you think about that you know all, all the all the variety it to me it evokes a sense of awe for one and uh, a sense of sort of appreciation of the divine uh, mm -hmm. I, I really feel like nothing is accidental and and all this diversity and beauty and variety could not possibly have happened through some kind of billiard ball collision process um you know it's just all divine intelligence displaying or you know dancing yeah and the beauty of that and to be part of it yeah to be in it and to watch it and just be uh, observing i mean the good the bad and the ugly it's not all beauty i mean there's a lot of bad no, and ugly, sure. but um it's it's interesting in its own way too it's like wow wow i would never thought that way wonder how people think that way hmm yeah well some people actually argue they say well how could there be anything like god when you have the holocaust or you have babies getting shot in schools or yeah. you know, all these horrible things that happen how could there be a god and um you know i mean it's like saying shakespeare should have only written comedies um i mean if the if the universe is is the play and display of some kind of divine intelligence then there have to be all these varieties it's just that you can't have it all one way if you're going to have a relative creation yep and we have free will to an exercise free will otherwise that's an important they element they would say nope nope you can't do that nope nope but here we have all this free will and it manifests in strange ways yeah strange and diverse ways Okay, so wait a, minute. a couple more came, questions came in before we started today um, from two women in North Carolina. <laughs> I know who those two women are. Uh, one from Laurel O'Daniel who said, what does your daughter think of your book? And uh, go ahead and answer that. And then I oh, have... that's a great one. So yeah. um, she she's just lovely. And, you know, when I went on my, I said I was going to sell everything, retire, do my thing and travel the world. A couple of my friends went to my daughter, called my daughter up and said, you know, your mother's crazy. She's grieving and she's going to regret this. She has a lifetime appointment. I mean, this is, you don't just walk away from this stuff. And she said, you know, I think my mother should shake her rattle and release her inner butterfly. <laughs> and so she's totally supportive. You know, she just, she loves it. She she just thinks it's amazing, fantastic. And that, you know, the transformation is amazing. So it's funny how, you know, she would say, oh, mom, I don't know if I believe in all this stuff, but if she loses something, like she lost a ring, she said, mom, can you, can you go around and can you find that ring for me? And I, you know, <laughs> go and find stuff or what about this job, mom? Should I take this one or take that one? You know, yeah. it's interesting, you know, and, and many of the friends that were the most like, oh, I don't know what she's doing. She's gone off the deep end with this shaman stuff will come to me and say, can you do a session for me? I'm having this really big problem, right? And so what oh, do you think nice. about this? Or, or some, you know, someone died and can you see if they're here or there? And yeah. That's good to hear. Cause I was going to ask you actually, whether some, all your old friends felt that you had just gone off the deep end and they've washed their hands of you or whether, you know, some of them have adjusted to the new you and it, it sounds mm -hmm. like some of them have. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah, there's also a lot of people who are kind of closet uh, believers in in woo woo of, of one sort or yeah. another. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I, I hear stories of people like Dean Radin speaking at scientific conferences and people coming up afterwards and saying, well, I, I can't admit it publicly, but I really, you know, I'm into what you're doing. And, you know, right. I lose, lose my job if I announced it, but I can't keep it up. You know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot of people. In fact, um, What's his name? Gallup has done the Gallup organization has done surveys of people, who, Americans who and a large percentage have had mystical experiences, have seen UFOs or have had all kinds yeah. of far out things happen. Um, but they might not admit it to their dentist. Um, right, right. You know, and, and that's that's that where we get constrained by society and culture. Yeah. And we're living a life maybe that's not the life we would have chose or we might cho choose now yeah. but we can't figure out how to get out of it and we feel 
constrained and trapped. Like if they, somebody finds out, I'll be fired. I can't do this. I can't do that. And so here we are constrained into this sometimes a very unhappy bundle of energy. Yeah. Well, hopefully the times they are changing and, um, you know, we'll move into a society, God willing, that is more appreciative of, yeah. of the kinds of things we've been talking about. And, um, manages to get beyond all these you know destructive things that are costing so many lives and climate change being a big one um, which will cost a lot more lives than anything else has if it proceeds the way it's been going yeah um you know i got an email today from a good friend who was expressing a good deal of pessimism about the continuance of humanity and i think you know a lot of people can get down sometimes when you just um yeah. So we're in the middle of this great sixth great extinction event. We're losing exactly. animal, 150 species a day. 150 species a day. That's it's mind boggling. Yeah. You know, and then some people still want to say, oh no, there's no climate change. Ooh, I don't know. It feels kind of warm up here in upstate New York, warmer than it ever was before. Yeah. <laughs> so um yeah, so a lot is uh, happening. I recently watched an ex uh, a documentary about um how Exxon I was doing research back in the 70s and the Exxon scientists said, yep, oops, climate change is happening and it, it could be catastrophic and uh, we better do something about it. And they were, you know, kind of the company was sort of planning to make that sort of transition, but then various executives just shut down that research group and spent millions of dollars spending disinformation and doubt, um, yeah. you know, to just get a little extra money for, you know, a few decades. Um, sure, the same thing to, with- To um, hell with the consequences. Same thing with recycling plastics. I mean, there are yeah. emails coming out now that they knew that, you know, that, it, that, um, that it breaks down, plastics break down, and it was not recyclable. Right. They're not going to be huge. We're not going to have this huge plastic recycling. And it hit all that too. Well, so, we in other words, the, the microplastics public. are getting into the air and into yep. our bodies and into the fish yep. and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can't take it. We're not going to take a thousand bottles and turn them into, you know, chairs and things. They knew, they knew that. They knew that it was not. Well, if everybody turned in all their plastic and, and it were, you know, properly processed, maybe that would work. But everybody doesn't do anything. And the, va the vast right. majority don't do what, the, what they need well, to I do. I think the underlying thing is properly processed. It can't be properly processed. Uh-huh. Okay. That's what they were saying, that they knew yeah. that they, the, 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 the petrochemicals break down at some point and you can't keep recycling or recycling and, mm. you know. Interesting. There's so many things like that that could do us in, you know, or that could really yeah. create a hellish future for, you know, whoever remains alive. Um, and it's, it, it, I would be pessimistic if I didn't have this perspective that you and I have been sharing today, which is that there's something going on beneath the surface, which is hopefully going to blossom and counterbalance all the seemingly insoluble problems that um that are mounting these days yeah. and then you watch people like elon musk and others going to other planets in space and you wonder is that the plan we're going to just abandon this poor heap of trash that we've created yeah i think his th thought is that well an asteroid could hit and kill us all so we better have a plan b in case that happens yeah. And actually, you know, I don't know, he's a very controversial figure, but um, uh, we better not get into the details. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, forget that. <laughs> uh, yeah. I have a friend who taught him to meditate. and uh, Oh, very uh, cool. In fact, he recently went down to Texas because Musk said, I I'm working so many hours a day, I'm getting a little burned out. I, I, I need to have my meditation checked. And so my friend flew down there. and. Um, he had to schedule the appointment at one in the morning to, to check his meditation because Musk is so busy. So he had a rental car and he was out, out on, in, this, in the boonies because Musk has a little house near the factory that he's building near Austin. And as he left, it, it was pitch dark. He couldn't see what he was doing. And he, as he, he was backing out, he heard this scrape and he got out and he had backed into a, a Tesla. And... <gasps> oh. um, and the and thought Musk's assistant came out, and my friend said, uh, "Is that Elon's car?" And the assistant said, "One of them." And and he said, "Is he going to know about this?" He said, 
I'm not going to tell him. <laughs> <laughs> like that. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. There was one more question here. This would be a good one to wrap up the conversation, perhaps. This is from Karen Peters, also from North Carolina. After reflection, is there something you did not say in the book that you would like to talk about now? And you told me earlier that you're writing a new book. So something you've learned since. And what, what, what would you say to that? And what's going into your new book? Yeah, you know, I think one of the biggest things that I've learned working with people over time is that as we um, are grieving, for people or as we're caretakers, um, as we have a child who's deep in addiction, we really lose our connection with the practice of beauty. And so what I like to have people do is put on the refrigerator, practice beauty, and do one thing every day that makes you feel happy and makes you feel good. Because, you know, in our grief and despair and hopelessness as caretakers and um, parents of um, children with addictions and having lost children, we, we can, we're digging our neural networks of grief and despair and hopelessness digger, bigger and deeper and deeper. And so to begin a practice of beauty, to do one thing a day, whether it's um, a, a flower or go to an art show or go to see a, um, a sunrise or a sunset, um, go for a walk, anything, one small thing that's just that practice beauty, practice beauty, so we can dig some new neural network, so we can get out of just digging deeper and deeper hopelessness and despair. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Listen to some beautiful music. There's all kinds of things. But yeah, so many things. So if you just put that on your refrigerator, practice beauty, it's sort of a, a visual. Because otherwise, you know, we forget it. We get lost. We get lost. Are you reaching down and placating your dog? Yes, I'm placating my little dog. Who's pick ready him up to... again if you want. Yeah, he's like, I don't know what he wants. He's probably like hungry. He's like, he's where's like, my what, dinner? Yeah, what's what the heck? talking? Can we do something? He um, talked about, he got, he's got meat out for his dog. What are you getting for me? <laughs> yeah. No, but the thing about beauty, I mean, the, the suicide rate is so high in this country. Yeah. The murder rate, I mean, you know about it, having been a judge. Um, and I think there's a great deal of, obviously, despair um that those things um are symptoms of and it, it really my heart goes out to all the, the people who are despairing and and yeah. you know wanting to kill themselves and, and so on because i know and i know you know that there is such an incredible beauty to life that can be discovered and lived and you know yeah. such such an incredible joy and we're not special having discovered it anyone has everyone has access to it if they can just realize they do and then you know take advantage of it or plug in however they they can yeah, plug it, you can get re-plugged in you know yeah. that's the whole thing shift is gears. to shift gears what were yeah. those things that make bring beauty to life and do one little thing one thing each day one thing it, it's monumentally transformational and one thing leads to the next you know one thing leads to the next seek yeah. and you shall find knock and the door shall be opened mm -hmm. um you know you know it's like if you if you bite into an orange it seems bitter and you, mm. you might think oh oranges i don't like those but if you take the skin off and get to the inner quality of the, the inner value of the orange it's sweet it's a whole different yeah. thing so life is like that if, if you're stuck on the surface it's bitter. Yes. but if the deeper values are marvelous and, and sweet one and the whole aim of life is to discover those yes yeah, yeah. and lucky are the ones that discover it yeah. Whatever way it comes to you, even the most harsh and horrible ways, fortunate are the ones that can get to those deeper truths and the deeper beauty and wisdom. Yeah. Well, thanks, Karen. And so keep doing what you're doing to help everyone get to those deeper things. <laughs> um, and you too. Yeah. yeah. We're all doing what we can, as the Beatles yeah. sang. So... Uh, I'll link to your website as I always do, and people can go there and see what you're up to. And, you know, yeah. some people might be watching this a few years from now. So, whatever we say now might not apply then, but just whenever you happen to see this interview, if you'd like to get in touch with Karen and plug into what she's doing, um, you can, well, it's just Karen, KarenJohnson.net, or you can go to bat, her page on BatGap, and I'll yeah. be linking to that and also to her book. Um, and you can get involved fantastic yeah. yeah all right 
so thanks. Um, Thank and thanks you. to those who have been listening or watching. Next week, I'll mm -hmm. be doing a second interview with um, Dwayne Elgin, who uh, wrote a great book called Choosing Earth. And it pertains to a lot of the things Karen and I have been talking about today, about you know the fate of the earth and, and how deeper spiritual unfolding might might save the planet um and i started reading it about a year ago i thought oh this is great i want to interview him and he kept putting me off because he wanted to wait until the second edition came out or till his film was ready or something but he's ready and so we're going to do that that interview next week so check it out um okay we'll be in touch karen Thanks. all right thank you talk to you later great talking with you bye bye bye